Well, welcome everyone to our second ever Lewis House Lecture. My name is Brian Marshall. I am the director here at Lewis House. I also work for this other place called CSF. Some of you all may know, Christian Student Fellowship, but uh, so excited about the work of Lewis House and to finally have this place kind of up and running and going. It's been a long time of praying and thinking uh, about uh, a ministry like this. And so uh, I, I had some people asking me earlier, what, what is this place and how long has it been here? And so just in brief introduction of Lewis House, uh, Lewis House for right now is a temporary home for CSF, for Christian Student Fellowship which is campus ministry located across the street. Uh, we tore down the old building there, needed a place to, to meet. We didn't want to just disappear for two years while we were building a new building, so uh, we d decided to construct Lewis House, and Lewis House serves as a temporary home for CSF, but if construction guys are right, uh, they tell me by the end of the school year in April, hopefully we should be able to move across the street and use that space, at which point CSF will vacate this property altogether, and Lewis House, the Lewis House ministry, will solely be here. But for right now, Lewis House and CSF kind of coexist as a, as a ministry, ministries using the Lewis House space. Uh, what is Lewis House? We kind of jokingly say a little bit, uh, imagine if C.S. Lewis moved to central Kentucky, and what kind of ministry, uh, what kind of ministry opportunities and things would he look to do uh, that would reach both students as well as the community. And that's one of the one of the real distinctives about Lewis House that would separate it from CSF. And there are a few things, but one of those things is that while it is absolutely for students, so we have some of our Lewis House scholars here. We have Lewis House scholars in the building, a few, a few people. We've got some Lewis House scholars here. Uh, a two-year kind of life of the mind discipleship program that we walk our walk students through. Uh, but this Lewis House is not just for students, it's also for people in the community. Just a place to, to reflect theologically, to ask the big questions of life in, in really rich and good ways that sometimes uh, our churches, our campus ministries, uh, just sometimes don't have the space for maybe to, to do that. And so we want to be that kind of resource for Central Kentucky and certainly for campus and community alike. Some of the things we do, we do have a podcast. If you want to check out a podcast, we just did one with uh, Dr. Frey uh, earlier today. We have uh, our other one. Our first one was with uh, Dr. DeYoung on the, the seven capital vices, the seven deadly sins as they're popularly known. That's on there. So if you want to check out the podcast, you can do that. You can check us out on social media. I think all of the social media tags are someplace on some print piece that from some tree we killed to give you these things. It's somewhere in there. Uh, at Lewis House Lex. Is that right, Josh? Lewis House Lex on, on everything. There you go. Facebook, Instagram, all, all those sorts of places. So you can check us out there. Uh, our staff, if uh, uh, I'm one of the staff here. Derek King is our scholar in residence. There's Derek in the back. Uh, he's there. We got Rachel, Rachel Willoughby here in the, in the back as well. And I think, I don't know if Rick and CJ, Rick and CJ, maybe they are, they are part of our staff. And they do a great job. And right now they're directing parking. So they're, they're out there. Uh, we've got staff. So if you have any questions, you want to connect, anything like that, please check us out. We do have one of the things I'd encourage you to do afterwards. We will have some dessert afterwards. Insomnia cookies. Anybody an Insomnia cookies fan? They, they are great. So we've got Insomnia Cookies afterwards over in the house. Uh, I would encourage you, if you haven't checked it out before, our library. It's one of the more unique libraries in Kentucky. As far as I know, it's the largest um, theological library in the state that's not connected to like a school, university, uh, seminary, that sort of thing. And, and it is for community and students like You can check out uh, resources and hopefully return them as well. But you can get an account tonight. You can begin to check out books. It really is a fabulous, fabulous library that, uh, that a few people have helped to curate in, in good ways. So uh, just a few things about Lewis House. One last thing uh, I want to just note as we transition into lecture time, and I'm going to ask Brian Gall to come up here in a second. Brian is the, uh, he is the campus ministry director at the Newman Center down the street, our, our Catholic brothers and sisters down there. Love them. I know Father Steve was going to try to be here tonight, was actually up here for a little bit but had to leave early. Father Steve is, is the head of the Newman Center, but Brian's going to come up in just a second and introduce Dr. Frey. But just a word about the lecture series. What are the lecture series? You may have seen uh, in your cards uh, some of the upcoming lectures that we have. They're typically a monthly lecture. That's kind of what we've aimed for and some of the, some of the people you can see. But actually, we have another one next week. It was a unique uh, opportunity with our friends with Asbury University uh, where we, we kind of were able to share resources, great partnership with Asbury. Asbury I know Dr. Frey was just down there yesterday and, uh, and doing some stuff with them. But Pierre Savage was coming in 
into town, and Paul called me and said, hey, we've got this guy coming in, Pierre Savage, you know who he is? I'm like, oh my goodness, I saw his documentary, Weapons of the Spirit, like 20 years ago, and, and it was incredible, and it just left such an impression on me, and he said, well, we're bringing him in the area, would you like to kind of partner up on having him here? And so, uh, Pierre Savage is a Holocaust survivor uh, who went back to this town, La Chambon, in France, that was responsible for rescuing thousands of Jews during Nazi-occupied uh, time in France, and uh, he went back years later and made a documentary about this little town and what motivated these people to do such courageous, literally putting their lives on the line type of work. And so we're going to show his documentary. Pierre is actually here with us, is going to talk and share some of his stories uh, about the documentary, his making of it, and just his rich life experiences. And then Christine Pohl. Uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Christine Pohl's work, Dr. Pohl's work on hospitality. Uh, Dr. Pohl is going to be here. She was the first person who introduced myself, and I know Derek as well, to the documentary years ago. She was an ethics professor that I had uh, when I was in seminary. She's going to be here as well, and she's going to give kind of like a, about a 10-minute kind of reflection to say, what, what, what is it as Christians? How should we be thinking and responding to the things that are in this documentary? And that is next Wednesday night at 7. Uh, we are going to show the full documentary. There, there's been some miscommunication that we're going to show a short and 45-minute. We are going to show the 90-minute version of the documentary that he's just recently uh, updated. Uh, so it should be a, an exciting night there next Wednesday. And then, of course, next month we have Peter Lightheart. We have N.T. Wright, uh, who I'm sure some of you all know. That's on a Monday night. Ben Witherington uh, to close out our semester. And then several other great names coming next semester, including a theatrical production that we're hosting at the Opera House uh, downtown. So uh, great, great stuff. We're excited uh, for what all's coming. The lecture series is just, if we, when we look for guests to invite to the lecture series, and Dr. Frey very much embodies this, we look for three main things. One, we look for someone who's a solid scholar. They're just, they're just good. They've done their work. They have done the hard work of hours spent alone reading and thinking, and, and, and not just alone, but engaging with others and, and sharpening ideas. We look for somebody who's a good scholar. We also look for somebody who's, who's an excellent communicator, who can come and just communicate ideas richly and warmly, and I think you'll find that Dr. Frey does that in a great way. And then also practical topics. You look down through the topics, I mean, just these, these are all just practical issues that we want Lewis House to be about. You know, good scholarship, good communicators, great practical topics. So, uh, so tonight, you know, the lecture series, it's kind of somewhere between a hybrid of, you know, an academic talk and, and a little bit sermonic. I mean, it's not just a, an academic lecture, but it is that thing of using your minds because Lewis House is committed to love the Lord your God, Jesus says, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. And, uh, and especially for students here, you all are being challenged daily, and really all of us in here of any age are being challenged in the culture we live in. How do we think as Christians? How do we think about the, the world, the vast world of ideas that, that come across our way that we've got to engage with daily? How do, how do we think faithfully? How do we think Christianly? And, and so, you know, in a lecture series like this, a lot of times there's not space in our Christian world, if you will, to think deeply, to wrestle, to really use our minds in a strong way. And so tonight, I hope that you kind of go away from here and go, man, I really was wrestling with some big ideas here, maybe in a space that you wouldn't find elsewhere. So thank you all for being here tonight, and uh, welcome Brian Gall to the stage to introduce Dr. Frey. Good evening. Uh, it is a pleasure to be with all of you tonight and to be able to introduce Dr. Jennifer Frey. Dr. Frey is currently an associate professor in the philosophy department at the University of South Carolina. Prior to joining the philosophy faculty there, she was a collegiate assistant professor of humanities at the University of Chicago. Dr. Frey earned her PhD in philosophy at the University of Pittsburgh and her BA in philosophy and medieval studies with a minor in classics at Indiana University Bloomington. Her research lies at the intersection of philosophy of action ethics, and metaphysics. She has co-edited a book titled Self-Transcendence and Virtue. She also writes for the Virtue blog and hosts a popular philosophy, theology, and literature podcast called Sacred and Profane Love. It is my sincere pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Jennifer Frey. Okay, um, I apologize because I don't have a PowerPoint, and there's this amazing screen behind me. Um, thank you so much to everyone at Lewis House for inviting me and just for doing what you're doing. I just think you're doing incredible work. And uh, thanks for inviting me back to the great state of Kentucky. 
I am thrilled to be here. I spent a lot of time here as a child. Uh, I'm from Cincinnati. So anyway, <coughs> um, all right, we're going to do some philosophy. I hope that's OK. Um, I want to talk to you on a kind of philosophical level about human happiness and about what sort of life you should aspire to live and what sort of real human goods would be at the center of such a life. And I'm going to draw on the Western philosophical intellectual tradition uh, to build my case that friendship is at the heart of happy human lives. And that whether we're Christian or whether we belong to some other religious faith or whether we're totally secular, uh, that we should be able to name and acknowledge this philosophical truth about friendship. Um, and then um, I want to kind of throw things into a slightly more the theological register at the end and talk about charity, uh, you know, divine charity as a kind of friendship. Um, and then I'll diagnose some challenges that I think uh, particularly young people face, not just young people, uh, about finding true friends um, and how philosophy might help you have better friendships. Okay, but I'm going to start with Aristotle. How many people have read any Aristotle? Okay, there's a smattering of hands. That's great. Uh, Aristotle, obviously one of the great Greek philosophers, student of Plato. You've probably heard of him. Now, I'm going to talk about uh, two books that Aristotle wrote, The Nicomachean Ethics and The Politics, uh, two, two texts that have been extremely influential in the Western tradition. And uh, Aristotle's discussion of friendship is in the eighth and ninth books of his ethics, which consists of 10 books. But the first thing that I want to note about Aristotle's ethics is that he actually devotes more time to friendship than he does to any other topic, right? And the second thing I want to note is that you wouldn't really register this as a contemporary reader of Aristotle, at least not if you were looking at the contemporary scholarship. Uh, if you pick up like sort of one of these magisterial commentaries on Aristotle's ethics, it'll probably be like 300 pages, and uh, you might find friendship in a footnote, which is weird, right? He talks about it more than anything else, so why is that? Um, it's almost like we're vaguely embarrassed or we're perplexed that Aristotle wasted so much time on a topic that just really wasn't worth it. Um, so why is this? I think there is a reason for this. And that is that friendship and the kind of unique love that exists between friends has been marginalized in contemporary philosophy. Like, philosophers don't really talk about friendship. I, I do ethics. We don't really talk about friendship. Insofar as contemporary ethicists worry about friendship at all, they kind of see it as a problem, right? So they tend to see friendship as in conflict with morality where morality is understood as some sort of system of rules and duties that govern right action uh, and that hopefully uh, govern the choices that we make as individuals. So what's supposed to be the conflict? Well, the supposed conflict between morality and friendship or justice and friendship is supposed to be that justice asks us to treat everyone the same, right? Uh, to, to not discriminate. In, in, how, in how we treat them. But friendship demands, actually, that we treat our friends with a kind of care and affection and concern uh, that we just don't give to other people, right? I mean, you, you care more about your friends, right, than you do about your strangers, mere strangers or acquaintances. So is this bad, right? Some, sometimes philosophers worry about whether or not friendship is bad, but they don't ever really bother to explain what's good about it. So I think in the classical, and when I talk about the classical tradition, I mean both the classic pagan philosophical tradition and also the Christian tradition. I think that if we turn back to that, we can make some progress on how we think about friendship. Uh, and to help us put friendship back at the center of our moral and political thinking, as it was for Aristotle. So for Aristotle, friendship is not just like a private ethical thing, but it, it's a political topic. And I actually think that's correct. So let me say a few things about the Nicomachean ethics, right? Uh, the first thing I want to note is that the study of ethics, the philosophical study of ethics for Aristotle, 
is not undertaken merely for the sake of knowledge. So it's not just that like you wanna know true things, uh, but it's for the sake of being good and living well, okay? That's the point of it, it's a practical science. Uh, and so given that, Aristotle's very first question in the ethics is what's the highest good, right? What, <laughs> what uh, is the good at which my practical thinking and deliberation and reflection should be aimed, right? What's the best I can aim for? Now, Aristotle calls this good eudaimonia. Eudaimonia is a Greek word. There's no great translation of eudaimonia. Um, so I'm just gonna call it the happy life, right? Or human flourishing. Those are kind of interchangeable. And he thinks of eudaimonia, or the highest good, um, as a kind of way of living, or being, or doing, okay? It's not just like, a passive condition that you find yourself in. It's not reducible to psychological states, but it's a way of living. Um, and Aristotle thinks, well, we have to identify such a life, whatever we would call the eudaimon life, with characteristic human capacities or abilities that we think exemplify human excellence, right? So, so what does an excellent human life look like? And I'm not gonna go through the arguments because it would take way too long, but the first three books of the ethics are just meant to establish that the sort of activity that constitutes an actually eudaimon life, a flourishing life, consists in the exercise of the virtues, so virtuous activities. Um, and virtue, he thinks, is a manifestation of right practical reasoning or just good sense about how to live. Now, at this point, you should already detect that we are in a very different conceptual space than Aristotle, right? Because when we think of happiness, we think of feeling good. We don't think of living well, right? Kind of, we have a kind of degraded or cheapened conception of happiness, and it's totally subjective, right? So I think a, a contemporary understanding of happiness, you just think of someone who feels good you might cash that out in various ways, but at the end of the day, they just have a positive psychological affect, okay? Now, the problem with that is that you can have a positive psychological affect, you can feel really good, uh, but your life's not really good, right? You're not actually living well. Um, so when Aristotle talks about happiness or the diamond life, the important thing to remember is that yes, psychologically um, it's positive, but it's positive insofar as it reflects objective conditions about how you're living your life, right? So there is a strong objective component to his account of happiness, which kind of drops out of the contemporary account. Okay, so for Aristotle, right, if you're not happy, then you've kind of missed the mark or the point of your life or the goal of practical reason. Uh, you haven't attained the highest good. Um, so again, it's not just about being subjectively satisfied. So that means you can't just take a pill to make yourself happy, okay? You can't just uh, plug your consciousness into some kind of virtual happy world. You actually have to in your own life, in your own choices, reflect human excellence, right? Uh, so you can't be happy without virtue. There's like no path to eudaimonia except through the cultivation and exercise of virtue. What's a virtue, right? I, virtue is basically just a settled disposition, a kind of readiness to think and act and feel and desire in ways that will manifest human excellence. Okay, so the master virtue for Aristotle is prudence, the Greek is phronesis, but it's basically just that you have good judgment about what to do in the circumstances of your life, and that good judgment allows you to make good choices. Now, Aristotle recognizes, which you probably already know because you're a human being, is that it's actually really hard to have good judgment, right? Think of all the ways that your judgment can be impaired. So Aristotle thinks it's not enough uh, just to have intellectual virtue or a good mind, but you also have to have moral virtue. 
you have to have well-ordered loves, is the way that St. Augustine would put the exact same point. So you need to have courage, for example. Courage regulates the fear that you experience and makes you neither a coward nor a bore, but someone who feels the right amount of fear in the moment. Temperance regulates your capacity to experience sensual bodily pleasures, right, so that you're neither a total prude or a profligate. Justice makes you ready to respect the rights of others, right? Uh, you're not going to steal from them or, or murder them or something like that, and so on. And Aristotle also thinks you don't get virtue for free, you're not born virtuous, and you're not just going to become virtuous. So if you think about a human infant, like it's just going to walk at a certain point. You don't actually have to teach an infant how to walk. If you have to teach an infant how to walk, he already has some kind of sensory motor processing problem, right? Um, so there are some things that like you're just going to do because of the kind of thing that you are. Um, but sadly, virtue is not one of them, okay? The only way that you can become virtuous for Aristotle is the result of a certain kind of education and training, right? The Greeks called it paideia. So for the Greeks, the purpose of education is not to get a fancy job or uh, it's not career preparation, but it's actual formation of you as a human being into something that we would call excellent, right? That's an education. Okay, so as the Nicomachean ethics progresses, we see Aristotle like slowly working his way up to the highest good. He begins with the moral virtues, then he works his way to the intellectual virtues, and then he gets to friendship, right? And then notoriously, Aristotle ends up saying that the highest thing that human beings can do is contemplate God. So ultimately, you have to think of friendship in that context, and I'll return to that at the end of the talk. But here's how Aristotle opens up book eight of the Nicomachean Ethics. He says, no one would choose to live life without friends, even if he had all other good things. This isn't a statement that Aristotle bothers to uh, argue for or defend, it's just like the data that he wants to explain. So he takes it as obvious, but a life without friends is not a life that anyone would find desirable or choice-worthy. So given its centrality to living well, the obvious question for Aristotle is, well, what is friendship, right? What is this relationship? What is this good? And this is what Aristotle says that friendship is. He says, friendship, in its essence, is reciprocal goodwill between two persons, so you have two people that will one another's good, who seek to live one life together. Okay, that second part is really key. So reciprocal goodwill between two persons who seek to live one life together. So friendship requires mutual affection. It requires like-mindedness. It also requires for Aristotle, and this becomes very important, some kind of equality between the friends, okay? So Aristotle thinks like if you're just too unequal, if your one friend is like super rich and powerful and you're a slave, right? Or um, I don't know, it's like one friend is just an intellectual powerhouse and, and another friend, you know, can neither read nor write. He thinks you're not really, you're not really apt to be friends, right? And that's because you're not apt to share one life together, right? So you have to have a kind of baseline equality for that. Um, because it really is central to Aristotle's vision of friendship that you have common goals, common ends, right? That are the basis of your shared activities. And it's also part of Aristotle's notion of friendship that what's essential is the sharing of hearts and minds, right? So your friends, like, yeah, you might do all kinds of stuff together. You might play basketball together or go fishing together or go shopping together. All of that's totally fine. But if you're not sharing your hearts and your minds, right, then it, it's, not, it's not really friendship. So friendship is a unique kind of love, a love that's only between humans, okay? So 
Aristotle uh, denies that you can be friends with your dog or that dog is man's best friend. Um, so I'm sorry, uh, this upsets some people. But I think it's, it's probably correct. Um, you can love your dog and your dog can love you and I definitely will not deny that. Um, but what you can't do with your dog is the thing that's so essential for Aristotle and that is you can't share your heart and your mind with him. I mean, you can you know, talk to your dog, it's fine. But your dog's not gonna talk back is the thing. Um, you don't know your dog's wildest dreams uh, because he cannot tell you. So, whatever love is between you and your dog, it's just not the love of friendship as Aristotle understands it, right? Um, and Cicero, Cicero is a great Roman philosopher. Um, he actually writes that besides wisdom, there's nothing better in human life than friendship. And also, he agrees with Aristotle that we cannot understand friendship apart from virtue. So he says that those who regard virtue as the supreme good are entirely right. But it is virtue itself that produces and sustains friendship. For without virtue, no friendship can possibly exist. So one of the things that I want to do by the end of the evening is to convince you that that's true actually, that without virtue, no real friendship can exist. So why do these great pagan philosophers connect virtue with friendship? Well, it comes back to the connection between virtue and happiness. So when we're thinking about friendship, and we're thinking about what does it really mean to will the good of the other? Like, what does it really mean for me to will your good? Um, we're talking about wanting our friends to be happy, but not alone, but like happy with us, right? So friends have a kind of love or mutual affection for one another, and there's a self-conscious recognition of this love between the friends, right? So your friend knows <laughs> that you love him and vice versa. And this love is a kind of being drawn out of yourself right, towards the good that you see in the friend. So in order to understand this, we have to understand the good. And that's where virtue enters into it. But of course, Aristotle's a philosopher, so it gets slightly more complicated. Aristotle thinks of the good in three senses. Well, first he thinks of the good as the object of desire. Right? So you want things, you're attracted to things, insofar as you perceive something as good about them, right? But there are three kinds of good that you might be picking out in something that you're attracted to. The first is that it's pleasing. The second is that it's useful to you, given some other good or purpose that you want. And the third is that it's simply good, that it's just good in itself. So just as there are three objects of love, there are three basic kinds of friendship for Aristotle what he calls friendships of pleasure, friendships of utility, and last but not least, friendships of character, or friendships of excellence. So let's start with friendships of pleasure. And I can guarantee you, you have some friendships like this. It's not terrible, um, but I can just guarantee that you have some. So when you think about these different kinds of friendship, what you're thinking about is the ground of the affection between the friends. What's the basis? Like, what's the basis of the friendship, really? And in pleasure friendships, it's the pleasure that the two friends get in participating in activities together. So maybe you have a drinking buddy. What do you like doing with your drinking buddy? Drinking, right? Going to the bar. Um, that's what you do with your drinking buddy. Um, I've had friendships of pleasure with running partners, okay? So what we do is, is we run for really stupid amounts of distance, and we talk about running. And that's just like a thing we like. Um, and we don't hang out in other ways. It's interesting. Um, my, my running buddies haven't tended to be my buddy buddies. Um, and, and Aristotle recognizes that like, this is a real kind of affection. There's something good about it. He doesn't think this is terrible. Um, but he thinks it's incomplete, right? And, 
And, and, and he thinks that these are unstable friendships, right? So imagine that your drinking buddy gets married and you call him up and you're like, hey, let's go to the bar. And he's like, yeah, my wife's not letting me go to the bar. It's not happening. Um, and you know, four or five times of this. And what happens to this friendship, right? It dissipates, it dissipates. Because that was what you did together. You went to the bar, you had your drinks. Running relationships can be destroyed by injury. Um, and, you know, what Aristotle is picking up on is the fact that once the basis of the pleasure is gone, the friendship tends to dissolve, right? And it's not necessarily bad or anybody's fault, but it just, that was the thing bringing you together, is the pleasure that you got out of one another doing certain activities, and there just wasn't any more there there, okay? So it's a, it's, a, it's a kind of love, right? But it's limited and it's incomplete. The second kind of friendship that Aristotle notes uh, are friendships of utility. So again, these friendships are grounded in the instrumental value that the relationship brings to both parties. So these are people who have affection for one another because um, of what the other person does for them, right? And again, I bet you have friendships like this. So my example for my students that I always use is uh, a study buddy that I had in college. And it just so happened that we were in the same Latin class and the same calculus class at the same time. And I was really good at Latin and he was terrible at Latin and he was really good at calculus and I was terrible at calculus. So we helped one another. And uh, we spent a lot of time together studying. That's what we did. We didn't really have any interests outside of this. And of course, once the, um, once the course on Virgil's Aeneid was over and once I finally survived calculus, we just didn't really have a reason to keep hanging out, right? Um, and, we, and we stopped hanging out, right? So it's really clear that the basis of the shared life was the utility that we were bringing to one another and receiving from our study sessions. And, um, you know, again, Aristotle recognizes this is like a real kind of affection. Um, I enjoyed studying with him. Uh, I wish him well. I, I hope he's doing well in life. I can't remember his name. Um, but, uh, but it's obviously incomplete, right? It's not, I mean, it's limited. It's incomplete. And, and for that reason, again, it's unstable. Because once the reason that you have for being together is gone, uh, the, fr the friendship kind of dissipates. Um, so it's those kinds of friendships are good but incomplete and unstable. What is the sort of friendship that is associated with really and truly living well? And Aristotle calls these virtue friendships or friendships of character. It's translated in various ways. But this is, this, is, this is really what you should aspire to have, are character friendships. Um, what is the basis of the affection in this kind of friendship? It's the love of the friend. It's just the love of the friend. You love the person. And that is the basis of the affection. So this is what Aristotle says. It's the friendship between excellent people, virtuous people, resembling each other in excellence, that is complete. For each alike of these wishes good things for the other insofar as he is good, and he is good in himself. And those who wish good things for their friends, for their friends' sake, are friends most of all. For they do so because of the friends themselves and not for any other reason. So this is like, this is like real friendship. This is the stuff that, um, is, is really meaningful and, and worth aspiring to. So, and, and in part of that is because it's not lacking in anything qua friendship, right? This is um, a love that is really deeply satisfying, would be another way to put it. And I mean, again, the other friendships are good, but they're just not complete, and they're not fully satisfying, and they're not stable. Now, Aristotle notes, and this is actually very important for him, Friendships, virtuous friendships are also pleasant, 
you enjoy being with your friends that you love, right? And they're also useful. Like friends really do help one another in life. It's just that the pleasure and the utility aren't the ground of the friendship. So Aristotle thinks there's a unity to the good that is present in good things, such that if something is intrinsically good, it's also going to be useful and pleasant. But it doesn't hold the other way. So what is merely pleasant or merely useful is not good in itself. So again, the best friendships are not based on utility. And Cicero, when speaking of his friend, writes that they weren't drawn to one another out of need, right? They didn't need something from the other. Uh, they were drawn out of admiration for one another. So this is Cicero and his treatise on friendship. Although many and great utilities resulted from our friendship, the cause of our mutual love did not proceed from the hope that it might bring us. For as we are beneficent and generous, not in order to exact kindnesses in return, for we do not put our kind offices to interest, but are by nature inclined to be generous, so in my opinion, friendship should not be sought for its wages but simply because its revenue consists entirely in the love which it implies. That's the reason. So for both Cicero and Aristotle, these, these great pagan philosophers, virtue is necessary for the best kind of friendship because without virtue, you can't really stably will the good of the other person. Why not? because it's virtue that allows us to see and recognize and judge correctly what is truly good for the other person. And it's also what enables us to act for its sake, right? So to help our friend attain and preserve his good. Therefore, it's never an excuse for wrongdoing that you did it out of love for a friend. Why not? Because a true friend will never want, let alone ask, you to do anything, right, that is, that is bad, that goes against character. Because again, this is the basis for the attraction, the admiration for the person themselves, the love for the person themselves. Um, okay, so another thing to notice about the good of friendship is that it cannot be broken down and parceled out. Like, it can't be distributed amongst the parties. Um, and that just means that the good of friendship is a common good, right? So uh, a common good is, is a good that's not competitive, right? So lots of goods are competitive. If I get, you know, I don't know, if, if I take pasta at dinner, right, there's less pasta for everyone else at the table, I shouldn't take too much, or it would be like an injustice. But that's a competitive good. But friendship isn't like that, OK? Um, lots of things that are good in themselves aren't like that, right? So if I get some wisdom, it doesn't take away from your ability to get wisdom, OK? It's not a competitive good. But it's also never the sole possession of an individual. A common good is never the sole possession of an individual. Why not? Because a common good is brought about by its participants doing some activity in common, and it's enjoyed by those very same participants. So it's a kind of participatory good. So it's a mistake to contrast the common good with the individual good. The right contrast is between the common good and the private good. Um, what's the difference? Well, what's going on in a friendship? What, how do you, as an individual, stand in relation to the good of the friendship? Um, it's not that uh, you see your individual good over and against this other thing, this common good. It's rather that you understand your individual good as a part of this common good. Like, you can't really separate your happiness from the happiness of your friends, right? And so what Aristotle says is, I mean, he says something really 
really interesting and that a lot of people puzzle over, but he says the friend is a second self. What does that really mean? Like, it sounds sort of vaguely megalomaniacal. Um, I think it's not. I think he's just saying that, again, in a friendship, in an in a excellent friendship, one takes the good of the friend as an essential part of their own good, right? Such that your happiness isn't something separate from the happiness of the friend. It's a common good in which both the friends participate. They're both participants in bringing about this good, in maintaining this good, and most importantly, in enjoying it, right? So what the friend wants for himself, his happiness, is no longer understood merely individually or privately. He wants it to be something shared in a reciprocal way with the friend. Uh, so that's friendship as a common good. Now, it's also really important to this tradition that friendship isn't always sunshine and flowers and blue skies uh, and winning football games. So Cicero dwells on the suffering, like real suffering, that he thinks is inter internal to true friendship and of the necessity of bearing one another's burdens, right? So actually, if you're going to be a true friend, you're going to suffer. It's going to be painful. Um, and so Cicero reminds us that the pain, which must often be incurred on a friend's account, is not of sufficient moment to banish friendship from one's life any more than the care and trouble with the virtues bring should be reason for renouncing them, right? So Cicero just sort of recognizes, like, yeah, there is no real love without suffering, without sacrifice. And so any real friendship in the deep sense isn't always going to like feel good or feel, feel cheerful. Um, but remember, happiness isn't cheerfulness, right? That's not the view. And I think you should be suspicious of anybody who claims, well, this is lots of people, but anyone who claims that it is, right? Because this is a very shallow view of what human happiness is. And probably this person just hasn't suffered enough to have even a modicum of self-knowledge, so you should not trust them. Um, <clears throat> now, you might think that you have very good friends, and you might, but I think you don't really know. You don't really know who your friend is until your friendship is put to the test. And friends have a chance to prove to one another what's the real basis of the friendship, right? Um, and that is the same as to say, I think, until they can prove their virtue. Um, and again, now I'm quoting Cicero. So Cicero talks about the importance of friends being honest, right? So he thinks, like, if you're really friends, you're not just going to tell your friend what they want to hear. You're not going to be like, oh, honey, you look great in that dress. You're going to be like, that's a terrible color. It doesn't fit. It's way too small. Um, that's probably maybe, I don't know, maybe your friend will laugh, maybe they'll get a little irritated, but you're going to be truthful to your friends, right? So he says, the greatest blame rests on him who spurns the truth when it is told him and driven by the complacency of their friends into self-deception and illusion. Let flattery, the handmaid of the vices, be put far away as unworthy of friends. Right? So friends aren't just going to placate one another. They're not just going to flatter one another. They're going to give them the truth. And so it belongs to friendship, Cicero argues, to admonish and to be admonished, not harshly, but lovingly and patiently. But if you love your friend, you will tell them the truth, and you will trust your friend to do the same with you. You will not let your friend be consoled by fantasies and illusions, and you will not let this happen because you actually love him. This is why friendship requires trust. Friendship requires trust and vulnerability and humility. Because if we cannot help one another to bear harsh realities, if we cannot suffer patiently with one another, then we do not really love one another in the deep sense that friendship holds out as an ideal for us. So it's a serious thing. Now, the other thing I want to note is for, for the ancients, there's a political dimension to friendship. I kind of mentioned this before, but I think this is somewhat shocking to us. We just don't think of friendship as a political thing. We think of it as a private thing. 
Uh, but Aristotle actually argues that the function of political art is the creation of friendship. Why? Because friendships hold cities together insofar as they bring about a kind of oneness and heart and mutual affection between citizens. And he thinks that good laws, right, are designed to instill virtue and friendship so that citizens can be oriented to a real common good, right? Um, and again, this is just a highlight like how different Aristotle's view is from the modern conception of friendship, where modern friendship is private, it doesn't have any real public dimension or depth. We think about it in terms of a kind of radical particularity rather than virtue. We just think friendship is about loving a particular person regardless of whether or not they have any admirable qualities, right? Um, and I think that this is because we have detached friendship from any conception of happiness understood as human flourishing. And of course, we've also detached happiness, again, from any kind of objective public criteria of excellence. So we think mob bosses might be good friends with each other. We think of Thelma Louise or Bonnie and Clyde. Uh, but I think something is um, really lost. Something is flattened out in this modern conception of friendship. And in order to try to show this, I want to reflect a little bit more theologically. So I now want to leave behind nature and reason alone and, and think in a more Christian context that's aided by divine revelation by sacred scripture. So I'm going to talk about a theologian, Thomas Aquinas. Maybe you've heard of him. Uh, he wrote some famous books. Anyway, Aquinas uh, follows Aristotle in many ways, and he follows Aristotle in thinking that the happy life requires virtue. But he makes distinctions as a Christian, as a Christian theologian, that Aristotle doesn't. So he distinguishes between perfect and imperfect happiness. Imperfect happiness is what you can have in this life, uh, and it's good, and it requires virtue, um, but it's not perfect happiness. And Aquinas, as a Christian, holds out hope for perfect happiness or beatitude, right? Which is, uh, you know, eternal life with God in the beatific vision. Um, and anyway, Aquinas thinks with Augustine, who was very important for him, that no created good, no created good, no person on this earth, no good thing on this earth is totally going to satisfy you as a human being. The only thing that's totally going to satisfy you is God, okay? He's got a whole account of that. I'm not going to dwell on it. Um, but he does think that God can perfectly satisfy you and that you can have this perfect happiness in beholding God as he is in his essence in the beatific vision. How do we get that? How do we get eternal life with God? Um, you can't do it on your own, it turns out, right? You can't just like work really hard to cultivate the virtues and get to heaven. That's not how it works. That's a heresy known as Pelagianism. Um, but there are these theological virtues. There are three of them. You've probably heard of them. They are faith, hope, and love, right? These are virtues that direct us to eternal life with God. And these come to us not through hard work, but through divine grace, right? Um, so we don't become hopeful in the same way that we become just or temperate. We cooperate with divine grace. We follow the promptings of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and this takes us into the life of grace, which hopefully leads us to the life of glory. Aquinas understands faith as a theological virtue as something that perfects our intellect. He thinks of hope and charity as something that perfects our will, right? And it's within the context of caritas, or love, in the Christian sense, that Aquinas discusses friendship with God and entering into a much higher society between human persons and God and the saints. So in the order of grace and charity, we can be brought into or lifted up in the divine life. And Aquinas is very clear that God is the highest common good of all creation, right? But we are called to that in a special way. We are called to it through friendship, 
right? And that is how Aquinas understands caritas. He understands it as friendship with God. Now, this is a very, very, very profound difference between Aquinas and Aristotle. Aristotle does not think friendship with God makes any sense. One, it's way too unequal. But two, Aristotle's God doesn't think anything besides himself. Aristotle's God is thought thinking thought. Uh, so Aristotle's God never thinks about you and also doesn't love you. Uh, it's just not how that works. So Aristotle can see no way to bridge the chasm between God and man such that they could possibly share one life together. That makes no sense to him. To put it another way, Aristotle has no grace, right? But charity is a theological virtue, right? is about the working of divine grace, and it allows us to share in the divine nature, thus attaining not equality with God, but a kind of shared eternal life with him. And it's this essentially grace, you know, we can call it equality if we put on all the writers, that is the basis of the shared life in common that for St. Thomas is at the heart of the idea that we can be friends with God, right? And it is God's self-revelation to us through Jesus Christ that is the basis of the oneness of mind in truth between God and man. So this is what St. Thomas says in the Summa Theologiae. He says, it would be absurd to speak of having friendship for wine or a horse or a dog, yet neither does well-wishing suffice for friendship, for a certain mutual love is requisite since friendship is between friend and friend, and this well-wishing is founded on some kind of communicatio. I am going to leave communicatio untranslated because there is no good translation. Accordingly, since there is a communicatio between man and God, inasmuch as he communicates his happiness to us, some kind of friendship must be based on this communication of which it is written, and now he cites scripture, God is faithful by whom you are called unto the fellowship of his son. The love which is based on this is charity, where it's evident that charity is the friendship of man for God. That is the question on divine charity in the Summa Theologiae. Now, Aquinas thinks that God communicates his own happiness to us by making us in his image, that is to say, by making us rational and free. Another way to put that point is to say by giving us the natural law, the right use of which we participate in God's eternal law. Only rational creatures can attain this kind of communion with God that in its highest form is found in the beatific vision. Now, Aquinas' God, unlike Aristotle's God, is a creator, and he made man in his own image and likeness, and he made man for himself as a thing to be brought into communion with him, loving communion with him. God didn't have to create. He didn't need us. All of creation is a gratuitous gesture of love a communication of God's goodness. But again, that communication to man is special and is the basis of the friendship of man for God, the basis of charity. So that's how Aquinas, as it were, baptizes Aristotle's philosophical account of friendship and throws it into an explicitly Christian register. And um, I want to say... A few things since um, it was promised that I would be practical, and that's somewhat difficult for me because I'm a philosopher, but nevertheless, I will say some practical things. And the first is that you should really make having uh, excellent friendship a priority in your life at this stage in your life. I'm speaking to students, okay? You can actually use Aristotle's taxonomy to reflect on your friendships and figure out who's really going to be there for you when the rubber hits the road and who's not. It's good. It's clarifying. It's a useful exercise. If you find you don't have any true friendships, you should try to work to have them because I think it's true that these friendships are the basis of flourishing lives. But since I'm speaking also in a Christian context, I think that young Christians in particular 
need to understand their friendships with one another as ultimately ordered to friendship with God. Because it's ultimately your perfection. That's the highest common end to which your friendship ought to be ordered. And you ought to be trying to help your friends to live a life of grace so that you can get to the life of glory. I'm not saying that you should only be friends with other Christians. I am not saying that at all. And I have many friends who are atheists, because I'm in the academy and almost everyone's an atheist there. But, um, but I will say um, that they wouldn't really be my friends if they didn't know and understand me, which is to know and understand that I am a Christian and that my whole life is ultimately ordered to that. Because if you don't, right, if you're not able to love me uh, for who I am, then you can't really be your friend. You can't really be my friend. And I think that um, you can and should really love people who are not Christian but uh, the people that you love as Christians, you should love in a higher way and a higher form of friendship. So that's it. Thanks for your attention. I hope you have some questions. Here's what we'll do then. I think, uh, CJ, we've got a microphone up here. If anybody, I know if you've got a question you want to ask, we'd love to have you ask the, the question. I know Dr. Frey said earlier, she's like, actually, Q&A is actually my favorite time or kind of yeah. one of my favorite times because I just love the interactive element. Oh, I don't know if you want to Great. I get chair. to sit. Yeah, that's great. You, that's uh, fantastic. Hand Give me that. Paul. Brian, thanks. Hand me this. I'll, use, I'll switch you over here. I know you've Oh, you Are you going to sit? Okay. Yeah, um, let's do it. CJ, if you want, or Derek, here you go, microphone for anybody who wants to ask. I'll, I'll, I'll start off with a question okay. of my own is, um, and then give, these, uh, give you all a chance to think through a question. Uh, when you think through um, how, how, how does one, just maybe talk a little bit more about how does one go about forming good, virtuous friendships. I mean, you talk about those being so central uh, and, and important that, you know, you have these friendships of pleasure, you have friendships of utility, and then you have these friendships of virtue. I know you've got kids of your own that are getting ready to go to college, and so you want them to form friendships of these virtuous kind, these, these good life-forming, because there's bad life-forming uh, friendships, but good life-forming friendships for your own kids and, and for, you know, all of us of any age in here, yeah. how would you suggest we go about forming virtuous friendships? Yeah, well, again, here I think Aristotle is actually very helpful, very useful. Um, think about what friendship is. I mean, friendship is living one life together, so you're sharing life, you're doing stuff together, but, like, what are you doing? What end, right, are you aimed at? Or, and lots of things that you're aimed at are, like, nested in other ends, but, like, where is your friendship going, right? Um, that's kind of the best place to start. And if you, for example, if you've moved to someplace new, you don't have any friends there. Uh, this was the case for me when, uh, I, when I started college, right? And then again, when I started grad school, like I didn't know anyone. So how do I make friends? Well, you make friends like from where you are. So they're like my philosophy friends, obviously. And what are we doing together? Philosophy, <laughs> which I think is good. Uh, we'll go to the mat for that. Um, but then I also look for friends at church, right? Because I know that in, in pretty robust ways, like we have a common end, we have a common vision about the purpose of our lives. And so I think when you're thinking about friends, you have to be thinking about yeah, what do you like doing, and who's the kind of person that's apt to like to do that with you? Um, there's a bit of luck here. So Aristotle makes this distinction um, between, you know, goods that are kind of extrinsic to virtue and those that he calls external. So external goods are like beauty and wealth and being born in a decent society. Like, these are things that you don't really control. And Aristotle thinks, um, for example, Aristotle thinks, I think he's wrong about this, but he thinks um, you have to be beautiful to live a eudaimon life. He just thinks if you're really ugly, like, there's no, <laughs> there's no chance. 
Um, and then he just thinks, well, uh, that's I'm terrible, <laughs> you know? Because it's like not your fault if you're ugly. Socrates was famously ugly, by the way. So I don't know if this is a dig at him. <laughs> but, um, but at any rate, friendship for Aristotle is this kind of external good. There's a bit of luck there, yeah. right? Maybe you don't have, maybe there isn't like a stock of good people for you to... Um, now, I think here at the University of Kentucky, uh, I think here in this room, there are surely some good people. <laughs> you, so if you're searching for friends, I think you're probably in a good spot. Yeah. But it is something that you have to be strategic about. It's not, I mean, maybe it'll just happen, but like that would be luck. So you don't want to leave the most important things in life to chance or luck. Seems like a bad strategy. So I would think about it that way. Yeah, yeah, it's great. It's one of the things we we say here at Lewis House and CSF is just wanting people. I know uh, Newman Center, or other campus ministers, are like, hey, this is a great place to make friendships because uh, you're you're going to find those virtuous kind of friendships that help form you. I know you mentioned that even with your own kids. One of the things you look for in a college is Absolutely. going to be going to a place where they can find virtuous friendships. So, uh, question. Question for somebody. We have uh, we got a couple. Here we go. Green sweatshirt in the back, too. Go ahead. See. Oh, we got somebody over here. Okay, yeah, go ahead, Derek. Yep. I'm gonna... Hi. Hi. So um, you quoted Aristotle saying, friends who spurn the truth do not deserve the title of friends. Yeah, that was Cicero, but same difference. Okay, yeah. c okay Cicero. Um, so I was wondering uh, if you would comment on um, how to discern when to tell the truth in a friendship. So in my own life, I don't yeah. tell... I don't really speak much truth uh, or hard truth in yeah. my friendships of utility and pleasure, and I only speak uh, difficult truth that might cause conflict in my friendships of excellence. Um, but I'm wondering if there's a bit of a tautology there where then I'm not testing my other real friendships. And so I was wondering if you would comment, how do we discern uh, when to apply the truth, uh, particularly in relationships when we're not sure whether or not they'll withstand that truth? Yeah, I mean, it depends on the kind of friendship. So let's suppose that, like, you know, this is someone that you think, anyway, you're particularly close to. You think it's someone that you can trust. And you tell them something that you know they don't want to hear, but that they need to hear. And they just react violently. And they don't want to talk to you. And they're avoiding you. Um, I think that if that's something that happens to you, um, you can you can look for ways to bring them back, you know, um, but it's also a red flag, right? Because it means that you can't trust them to receive hard truths. And in terms of discernment, I mean, people are so particular, right? It's, it's hard for me to give general rules that I can just say, well, apply this rule and it will work because people are weird. Um, and sometimes people, I mean, there have been times in my life, and, and these times have been the hardest for me, where someone who I thought was my friend does something that really shocks me. And the first thing that I remember thinking in one particular case was, I thought I knew you, and I do not. Like, I, I have just realized I don't know you at all. And in that case, in that particular case, this person and I are acquaintances now. Uh, we enjoy our time together. Um, we are absolutely not real friends. Um, and, and I think that is just something that happens in human life. It's really hard. Um, but sometimes people just reveal things about themselves that, um, you know, might make you question whether or not you really do want to share one life together with them. And that can be hard. That can be hard. Um, so in terms of discernment, I mean, I think, you know, when you tell somebody something they don't want to hear, that's always unpleasant for everyone, right? Uh, unless you're friends with a saint, in which case, hold on to that. Um, but... But, you know, there are more or less tactful ways to do it. And, and the thing is, if you're friends with somebody, you know them. Like, you know maybe how to soften the blow or whatever. Um, 
But if it's something they need to hear, I just think you, you have to tell them. You owe it to them as their friend. You owe it to them as their friend, as someone who loves them. Yeah, if you, have, if you see a friend walking towards a cliff, you wouldn't just go, I'm just going to let you walk yeah. towards a cliff. You, yeah. would, you would say, hey, wait, you're walking towards a cliff. And That's there's right. a lot of other situations, I think, where this, this comes, to, you know, comes to the forefront where you need to say, I need to say something to you. How do you say that in love, I think, is the, is the real particular challenge. But I think, I think as a friend, you do need to and the, say and something. The, and the hard thing is there are going to be people who are just dead set on walking off that cliff. But so yeah. long as you and good conscience can say that you tried to stop them, I think that, you know, that's, that's real friendship. Yeah. Question, do we have a couple more? Yep. Go ahead. Yeah, okay, right here. Yep. It's not, but I Gr can hear green, you. Green so mic, Jack. Whatever. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so friendship with God sounds wonderful, given that he's perfectly virtuous. Um, yes. Why should <laughs> Did you all hear that? Everybody got that over here? Yeah. So basically, Why waste your time with we, these humans? we have a monk in training here. Uh, he's, uh, yes, and you go can ahead. just go for the big catch. See from the news. Yeah. Well, I think it's because, well, I'm, I'm you know, I'm just going to answer this as a, as a Thomist, as, as someone working from within that specific theological tradition. Um, you know, this, this life that we have, that has been given to us, uh, the goods that we have in this life and the happiness that we have in this life is a foretaste of our beatitudes, right? So the friendship and the fellowship that we have in this life is a foretaste. Um, one of my, I, I recently spent some time with some very dear friends of mine who happen to be Dominican friars in Rome. And we had this lovely, like, Italian dinner, and it was just the most beautiful evening. And I was going, you know, I was going back to my hotel, and, and Father turned to me, and he said, well, you know, tonight truly was a foretaste of the banquet of heaven. And it was such a beautiful thing to say. And so I think that in this life, this life that we have been given, in which we don't see God face to face, but we have hope, right? Um, God wants us to be happy. God wants us to experience a foretaste in heaven precisely to increase our hope and our faith and our love. And the love that we give here is preparing us for the love that we will receive from God. So it's all very connected. Um, and... You know, imperfect things are still very, very good. And we are imperfect, we're fallen, but we are still very good. Isaiah 6, even, that, that great passage, you know, where the seraphim are talking to one another, uh, and they're saying, you know, holy, holy, holy is the, the Lord of heaven's armies. And, and uh, but actually, and I'd never caught this until I was rereading, as Dr. Frey was coming from that, I was rereading that chapter in C.S. Lewis's book, The Four Loves, uh, that he's got a great chapter on friendship in there. And he points out, he says, uh, that the seraphim are actually saying that not to God, they're actually saying it to each other. Because there's something that the seraphim, there's something that we teach each other about God that we on our own could not see, that we need each other. So even in terms of just that particular aspect of growing closer to God, I think it's, it's very, very helpful. We need each other. But, but uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, some writers, and I think this would include C.S. Lewis with the four loves, if I remember what those loves are, um, would make a hard and fast distinction between friendship and romantic love. They're two different things, yeah, and they're different, you know, in, in many ways. But is it possible that they could come together in the same relationship? That yeah. you could have romantic love and also be the friend of your beloved? And yeah. your beloved this is what friend. every college student's hoping you're going to say yes to. <laughs> Here, yes. So. Yes. I will say yes, as an Aristotelian. I mean, it's interesting that Aristotle does not draw this hard and fast distinction. Right, um, and so Aristotle, I mean, Aristotle has some wacky views about women, and as a result, he has some wacky, I mean, literally wacky. Um, it's fine, I, you know, it was a long time ago. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I still love him so much. Um, but 
like he like he thinks that marriage is a kind of friendship like you know it's like a really lower form why because of the inequality between men and women and so um, so if you take that out of it and you think of the spouses as equal right which I do um, and which I, I believe that that scripture also thinks of us all as equal um, then I think yeah that is uh, one of the most important friendships in your life. Um, and, and it's not for everyone. Uh, marriage isn't for everyone. Um, but there's something very beautiful about it. And in, in marriage in particular, um, you know, this point about your happiness being bound up together is, is like really clear. Like if your spouse is miserable, you are going to be miserable as well. Um, and so, yeah, you, it's, it's very clear in a marriage that your spouse's happiness and your happiness are in some really deep sense the same. And, um, and I think in family life in general, when it's going well, you, you see really the nature of a common good because, <laughs> because you're creating and sustaining it. Right, so, so in the family, um, it's not correct to constantly be focused on your individual good, like in competition with everyone else. Um, you really have to think about how you contribute to the common good of the family. You're never gonna happy, have a happy family <laughs> unless you're doing it in that way. And um, so yeah, I, 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 th I think that they absolutely can and should come together. I think that um, Aristotle's, uh, well, there's so much that I could say about this, but the, the simple answer is yes, I think they can come together and, and in marriage they should come together, absolutely, yeah. And I should also say, and this is something that Aristotle would also deny, is that men and women can have friendships of excellent character, right? And it doesn't have to be your spouse. Um, I think I have those in my life. Um, yeah. Good. One or two more questions. And I know for those of you who are like a little shy about asking questions in front of the group, I know Dr. Bray was with Asbury last night and she said, one of my favorite times of the whole time was when people just stopped and we hung around till I think Finally, about midnight, I think they, they said they shut down because people just kept coming up and asking questions, hang out. So you will have some time afterwards if you want to just ask a more personal question. But a couple more for the, the group here. Yeah, go ahead. Who, uh, go? Yeah, so I guess what I'm wondering about is how we should think about friendships that are sort of uh, inherently organi organized around uh, unvirtuous activities or concepts. Um, like I'm thinking in particular about like the concepts of character and virtue that were prominent like in the American Gilded Age, like the robber barons, right, where they didn't see um, uh, virtue as having to do anything with like a public trust in terms of business or politics, but had to do with uh, the character that you showed to your network of friends. Um, so involved like kickbacks and this sort of things, but they did genuinely have like, um, there was a relationship of utility, but also there was like admiration amongst each other, but that network of friends was, uh, uh, W w was not based around uh, was based around admiration or even genuine friendships and usefulness, but but not or uh, not organized around something that we would consider virtuous. Yeah. yeah. Can, yeah. Mo can mob bosses be friends? Right. Yeah. I mean, let's yeah. just think about the Godfather. Right. We all know the Godfather. Right. Please tell me you've seen the Godfather. Okay. Um, You're like Italian, I got, I got so like I know. Really I know. Really worried is a, there for a yeah, second. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it starts off and you, you sort of think, yeah, like this mob thing, like there's something attractive about it, you know, like there's so, there's so much loyalty and it's so tightly knit and these people are like really taking care of one another. But by the time you get to the end of Godfather 3, you can see quite plainly that all of these people have been forced to completely turn their backs on one another. Well, half of them have killed one another. Um, so it, it, it wasn't real, right? And one of the reasons why it wasn't real is because they are committed to crime and injustice. And when you're committed to vice, um, you're gonna hurt people. 
and you're going to hurt your friends. I mean, it's, it's like a lot of collateral damage, right, in the, in the life of Vice. And you see this played out like really beautifully in the Godfather movies. And you know, it's like the end of Godfather One, and you're like Michael Corleone, like he's you know, I don't know, something intriguing there. And then by the end of Godfather Three, you're like, oh my God, this is a mess. So, uh, you know, the thing the thing is, it doesn't become clear uh, right away. Right? That's that's the thing about life is you can be pretty far into it and be like, how on earth did it get this bad, mm -hmm. right? Like I was really having fun there for a while. Things looked really good. You know, it's kind of like, I don't know, it's like the same thing in The Great Gatsby if we want to talk about the Gilded Age. It's like it looked really fun for a while. Ooh, it did not end well, mm. right? Um, and so again, what Aristotle is banking on in the virtuous friendship is its stability. What's the ground of the stability? Like the love. And the love is tracking what's really good. And that's the only kind of stability that you're going to get. And now Aristotle thinks um, there's only so much stability you can get. Like even the most stable thing is fragile and chancy. And he thinks like, I don't know, you could wake up in the morning with cancer and it's not your fault. And things just go wrong for human beings. Um, and, that, and, the, and there's some truth in that, right? Uh, the goods of this life created goods or chancy things were subject to all kinds of forces that we can't control. But again, and this is where a Christian context is very different, um, if you believe that this life isn't all that you can hope for, right, then all that really matters in the end is where you're going, right, and what waits for you there. And um, so, so again, I think as Christians, you have to look at things in some sense, subspecie eternitatis. Like you, you have to keep the long view. And that's hard. It's easy to lose perspective. Yeah. Yeah, certainly there's a blinding effect to sin that you can't oh, for see. Sure. That you can't yes. see this. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yes. Yeah. Disordered design. Yeah. I think we had one more question. Yeah. Thank you for your talk, Dr. Fritz. I was wondering, it seems like I'm pretty limited as a human being, and I might be only able to be friends with a certain amount of people. Yes. But on the other hand, there is this command to love my neighbor as yes. myself. So I was wondering how you or maybe St. Thomas might parse out that difference between the love of friendship and the general love of late neighbor commanded in the Christian life. Yeah, that's such a great question. Um, yeah, that's a great and profound question. Um, and I can't give a complete answer, but I can say that, um, you know, and, and this is an element that is kind of in Aristotle too, but not really. So Aristotle has this idea that, um, suppose you meet a stranger on the road, and he's not even a fellow Athenian, he's just a stranger on the road. Right? Maybe he's a barbarian um, in Aristotle's sense. Uh, Aristotle still, still thinks that if you recognize him as bearing human form, there is a kind of, there's a kind of affection that you have that is natural. Just insofar as you recognize, like, this is a member of my kind. It's thin, it's pretty weak. Uh, is it going to stop you from killing him? you know, or robbing him. Uh, Aristotle thinks it, it should, but, you know, is it necessarily going to do that? Um, and I think that when we think about this command to, to, love, um, to love our neighbor as ourselves, I think in, for St. Thomas, it boils down to um, a recognition that it's a bearer of human form, but that means something higher for St. Thomas, which is that it's made in the image and likeness of God. And so that it, it too is something created to be with God. And so it too shares the same highest common end as you. And, um, you know, how does that play out in various ways? I think it just totally depends on the circumstances. Um, and of course, we know there are saints who 
exude a kind of very radical love for everyone. Um, and of course we think that's good. St. Thomas would say that they have an overabundance of charity, right? I think that a lot of us have maybe a little bit of charity. Like would there, you know, we, we could stand to grow in the life of charity, but I don't think there's any real simple explanation of uh, what exactly it demands of you. I mean, of course it demands that you treat this person with justice, but charity is higher than justice. Um, I think that, um, I don't know, but I would say at a baseline, you recognize uh, that this is, this is something that is, that is meant to be with God and you have to treat it accordingly. Yeah. Well, would you all just put your hands together and thank Dr. Frey for being with us tonight. And She, she is going to stay here and is glad to hang out. In fact, I'll just, you know, we'll maybe even clear out a little space here up front. So if people, if you want to come up and ask a question, uh, she may sneak over to the, to the next door and grab an insomnia cookie herself. I know you're still hungry from that run earlier. Um, if you have not filled out a Lewis House card, if you're not on our uh, mailing list currently, we'd love to have you. We send out basically a once a month, uh, once, twice a month, an email saying, hey, here's some things going on. Uh, we are working on the possibility of like a quarterly publication of just, some things that we're learning and thinking about uh, as well. And even, even the, uh, the monthly email list actually will be part of what we're including in that, or just things that we're reading, things that we're watching, listening to, podcasts, uh, uh, YouTube videos, uh, which is how we initially, I, I know I think I initially came across your work on the, uh, the uh, what was it, what's the, uh, the, Aquan the no, the Thomistic, Thomistic Institute, yeah, uh, great little YouTube channel there. So if you've not filled this out, uh, you can just fill that out give it to one of the staff, or even if you just will leave it in your seat, we'll clean those up later. And then just a reminder, next Wednesday night, uh, we'll be watching the documentary Weapons of the Spirit uh, with Pierre Savage here, the Holocaust survivor, coming and telling his story. Uh, I think that quote on there by Livesell, who uh, the author of Night, some of you all know that. I'm sure you probably had to read that in school. If you wish to learn more about men and women uh, could have done more to save Jews, watch Pierre Savage's point in the documentary. Great endorsement. Thank you all so much for coming. Insomnia cookies across the way. The library, go get a library card. Check out a St. Thomas Aquinas or Aristotle book and come up front and talk to Dr. Frey. Thanks so much.